Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our event this morning uh, on our report, Works in Progress, Assessing Employment-Based Temporary to Permanent Immigration Systems in Europe and North America. Uh, we are coming to you live from our various respective uh, homes and houses uh, due to the uh, coronavirus distancing, um, but we hope to still present you with an informative and interesting uh, report and conversation around employment-based visas in uh, the United States and North America and some comparisons with Europe. Um, as you uh, follow us here, um, you're welcome to join a conversation on Twitter using the hashtag BPC Live. You can also see our report at our website at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration, as well as other information about our immigration project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, now, we know that uh, that the current environment we are in um, is an interesting one to be talking about employment based immigration systems. Um, but we also know that this has been a long standing issue uh, in discussions uh, with how to reform our immigration system in the United States. And and so at some point we will be coming back to it, whether it's in the middle of recovery from where we are now or at uh, a, a, another point of uh, economic growth. And one of the things that we at BPC are trying to think about is how do we address our immigration system to make it viable regardless of our economic circumstances? How do we sort of future-proof the system? Which means looking at how we select immigrants and especially how we select those immigrants who are gonna join us as part of the US workforce. So this report is, is an attempt to look at one aspect of our legal immigration system, that is how high-skilled temporary workers convert to permanent residence. Um, our existing system uh, is one that it, it presents a bunch of challenges and complexities for that. Also may not work very well for addressing what our real skill shortages in our immigration system. And so one of the things we decided to do was look at other systems in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe and our neighbor to the North Canada, to see if there were any lessons we could learn from how they do it. So um, at this point in time, I will, uh, I will ask Chris Ramon to uh, give you a little overview of the report. You're welcome to go to the website and read it. It's in entirety. At the end of Chris's presentation, we'll come back and we will join with our panelists, uh, Julie Gillott from the Migration Policy Institute and Daniel Costa from the Economic Policy Institute to talk a little bit more about these issues writ broadly. You have an opportunity to participate as well. On the right side of your screen, you should see a Q&A um, uh, panel. Uh, you can submit your questions there. Uh, they will be um, take a look at and, and process through to me. So we will have opportunity at the end to ask those questions. Feel free to queue those up throughout our presentation and throughout the conversation this morning, and we'll try to get to those afterwards. So at this point in time, I would like to turn it over to Chris Ramon, Senior Policy Analyst with the Immigration Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center, to talk more about his report. Chris, over to you. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you for everybody joining us today. Uh, as Teresa noted, our report today that we're releasing is Works in Progress Assessing Employment-Based Temporary to Permanent Immigration Systems in Europe and North America. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So as Teresa noted, we really wanted to sort of understand how different immigration systems handle temporary to permanent transitions. And one of the reasons we did this is because primarily what you've been looking at the immigration debate here in the United States, that we've been focusing primarily on, on uh, selecting immigrants um, and looking at other countries and how they do this, but that's been primarily looking at uh, Canada and Australia, which have merit-based, point-based systems. And we really haven't thought about how we select and keep temporary workers in our economy, especially the ones that, you know, basically make major contributions to our economic well-being. So that's sort of the genesis of this project. Um, so, you know, what we decided to do is we decided to take a look at how these systems work in Canada and the United States, as well as Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. And what did we find? If we can go to the next slide. Well, what we found is that in terms of how temporary permanent pathways are designed, and I'll define that phrase temporary permanent in a minute, um, European systems actually have very streamlined designs that are integrated. So somebody who's temporary will, can directly go to permanent status, um, which is a little bit different from the North American models in Canada and the United States, which are actually independent of each other and have fewer overlaps between temporary and permanent uh, status and, and for those transitions. 
Um, the other thing to note is that, you know, these systems generally play a positive role in the economies of these countries, but there are a lot of challenges that these countries deal with with this. No immigration system is perfect, and essentially there are going to be a lot of challenges such as filling labor shortages and keeping temporary migrants um, that each of these countries face. And so as a result, I think U.S. policymakers need to be looking um, at these systems critically and select immigration policies based on their outcomes instead of their novelty or uh, the perceived benefit. Next slide. So what is a temporary to permanent system? A temporary to permanent system is essentially one where a non-citizen arrives to the United States um, or to another country to work for a set period of time and then eventually can transition to a permanent status to work and live in a country for an indefinite period of time. That's the basics of it, but this can work for various types of immigration, but we decided to look at high skilled immigrants in the case study, case study countries that we looked at. So if you can go to the next slide. So when we were looking at European systems in Canada, uh, sorry, in Denmark, Sweden, and Germany, one of the things that was interesting is I noted earlier is that these systems are actually fairly integrated. And the reason that they're integrated is that primarily these pathways are the main ways that um, immigrants um, or non-citizens can move to these countries to work and then eventually become permanent residents. It is actually, you can't go really just skip the line, go straight to permanent status to apply. You actually have to go through a temporary status first before you can transition over. Um, the way that you transition over, it can take a number of years, uh, five to eight years in each of these countries, depending on their systems. And you have to meet various requirements for uh, being able to access temporary status, but also various requirements for access a uh, permanent one. It's not like you can just automatically transition. There's various requirements you have to meet. So if we go to the next slide. This is what I'm talking about here. I think this now makes it a little bit clearer what I'm, what I'm saying. If you look at the model, and this is just sort of an abstraction of the models that we saw in the European countries, so each system has some variations, but this is really what you see, which is that there's a temporary stage and there's a permanent stage. The temporary stage is essentially a non-citizen worker uh, wants to go work in one of these European countries. They have to meet various requirements, including a labor market test. Um, if uh, the government approves the application, uh, they can go ahead and work. It's important to note that many of these systems require you to already have a job offer, not unlike what you see in the United States. And so if they can work for a set number of years and have their, permit, uh, their temporary permit renewed, then they can eventually apply for permanent residency that has its own set of requirements and eventually you're able to become a permanent resident so the government approves that. So simply put, you go from point A to point B to point C, one nice easy chain and that's how the European systems work. Next slide. Now, Canada and the United States are different because Canada and the United States actually have independent temporary and permanent programs uh, for high skilled workers. Um, basically, if you want to apply for permanent status in one of these countries, you can go through the permanent uh, immigration system in Canada. That's that the, their famed merit-based system. In the United States, that's the uh, employment-based green card system. And what you have is that um, you have that, and you also have uh, temporary programs that individuals can apply for. Um, you know, in the United States, that primarily is the H-1B high school visa. We've heard a lot about that, um, but that's one pathway that you can do that. So. These systems don't integrate, but there is some overlap and non-citizens on temporary uh, visas or permits in these countries may have pathways to be able to apply for permanent status in these countries. But this is a separate process, almost completely duplicative in some ways, depending on the country. Um, and there are different things that you have to do. It's not necessarily as integrated as the European countries. So if we go to the next slide. So. So if you go to, this is the Canadian, I call it the Canadian bridge model because there are various ways that you can kind of go from temporary to permanent status. So you look at this flow chart and you see that red is uh, the temporary pathway and blue is the permanent one. Yellow is what connects temporary to permanent. And the, the point here is that these are parallel systems um, and that you do have some ways to be able to go from temporary to permanent there are two separate pathways for high skilled immigrants. But as you can see, the real point is that they don't integrate and that there are some pathways that they can go through. And I think that's really the important thing to do is that uh, 
that there is some overlap, but it isn't integrated. If we go to the next slide, the United States is the same thing. But I actually call that even the fractured model because there's even fewer ways for you to be able to go from temporary to permanent status. Once again, blue here is the permanent status, the employment based green card system, and red is uh, what happens if you're on an H1B visa. There is one way that you can transition over at a certain point. Employers have to sponsor you for a green card if they want to, but then you have to go through this completely separate process to get a green card. Um, so again, this is the, make the same point to be making is that they're parallel systems with some overlap but not nearly as much integration as the European models. Next slide. So how do we assess these systems? What are their outcomes? Um, when we were looking at these systems, we wanted to get a sense of like what outcomes and, and what kind of impacts they had on their countries. And so there were three things that we looked at. One is whether they feel labor shortages. Um, the other one is whether they displace workers and lower wages, and finally, whether um, these systems actually facilitate temporary to permanent transitions. Next slide. So in terms of filling uh, labor shortages, you know, what we found in, in a variety of uh, peer reviewed studies is that we found that in the, in the United States and Canada, um, temporary and permanent workers do fill labor shortages. Um, if, we, if I have more time later on in this discussion, I can kind of add more nuance to how we'll we approach that literature for Canada and the United States. But what's actually more important is that the European countries actually struggled with this uh, because of low levels of employer recruitment of foreign workers, issues with foreign qualifications, recognitions, and varying individuals with language fluency. So they, they definitely, their systems were not exempt from dealing with these struggles. Generally, immigrants do not displace native foreign workers or lower wages in the five countries. There's not like a widespread displacement um, and you can make quibbles about certain things like temporary uh, permits in Canada or the H-1B program in the United States. But I think what's more important for this report is actually I think that the content, not the number of labor market tests, really is important for understanding, for basically mitigating any type of displacement. In fact, that I think is the most important thing to emphasize. If we go to the next slide. Next slide. So think a uh, prior slide, please. Now transitions between temporary and permanent status. Um, this is interesting because although the European systems look like they're nicely integrated and that they facilitate large numbers of transitions, we actually found that the data that Canada and United States actually have more uh, temporary to permanent transitions. Um, it's less clear in European countries, but I think the key reason is that we just simply have, um, the United States and Canada has more individuals we're seeking temporary status um, and permanent status. And that means that the numbers of, of uh, immigrants or non-citizens coming actually um, can sort of address some of the lack of integration in these systems can overcome it. So there's more transitions. So if you go to the next slide. Here is um, some data that BPC got from USCIS through a FOIA request. And what's important here is between 2010 and 2014, if you look at the H-1B category, um, 36% of individuals with dark green cards in this period came from H-1B visas. If you go to the next slide. In Canada, uh, this slide, you can see that a large number of uh, individuals on high scale um, temporary visas transitioned over to the permanent um, immigration system there um, in increasing numbers through between 2008 and 2015. Some contraction later on in 2016 and 2017, but the point still stands. Lots of transitions here between temporary and permanent. If you go to the next slide, this is where it gets interesting. If you look, Denmark and, and Sweden have the most comprehensive data. And what you're seeing here is that the number of temporary uh, work permits that are issued, which is the line, is significantly higher than the permanent resident uh, permits for work purposes that are issued. That discrepancy is huge. And if you go to the next slide, you see the same thing in Sweden, and that's actually even more that that, that divergence is more accentuated. And the way you see this is that, you, you know, given that you have a temporary to permanent integrate pathway, that more people are getting temporary visas in these countries, but fewer of them are getting permanent ones. And I think that that's probably the most important thing to see that the transitions don't necessarily happen in these countries. Let's go to the next slide. So what do we conclude from this study? 
Um, if we go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, there we go. So what we can conclude is that every system has its limitations. No system is perfect. And I think when US officials are, you know, they need to keep this in mind when they're looking at um, other policies from other countries, that no system is perfect. There is no uh, unicorn that we can pick that will make our immigration system better without some, uh, without address or with, that don't come with, with, with some weaknesses. Um, I think that that's really important. Another thing is that U.S. policymakers need to identify key policy goals for reforming the U.S. system before we start looking at ideas from other countries. I think one thing that we've been seeing with the whole debate around merit-based systems is that it seems like it's an interesting idea. I don't get the impression that sometimes policymakers or people who are deep in the weeds in immigration policy understand that there are weaknesses in these systems and it's better it makes more sense for us to define what we want from our immigration system first and then see what matches up with that and as a part of that i think we just need um selecting immigration policies from other countries um through an evidence-based approach for identifying and picking the the the, the policies and the programs and the, the measures that work best for reforming our immigration system. And I think the last thing is just simply, we need more research on this. We need researchers to continue doing more evidence-based research. And I think that's important to push the field forward. With that, I'll head over to Teresa. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and as I said, you can see the full report over on our website at bpc.org slash, uh, bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. At this point, I'm going to bring in the rest of our panel, uh, including, and I'm going to start with uh, Julia Jalad. Julia Jalad is a senior policy analyst at the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. Her work focuses on legal immigration system demographic trends and the implications of local, state, and federal U.S. immigration policy. She formerly was at the Urban Institute and has a Ph.D. in sociology with a specialization in demography, and she has been doing a lot of work and study on the ideas of what reforms might be uh, useful in the United States from temporary to permanent systems. Our other panel panelist is Daniel Costa. Daniel is Director of Immigration Law and Policy Research at the Economic Policy Institute. He's an attorney who joined them in 2010 and has been Director of Immigration Law and Policy uh, for the last five or so years. He's uh, back from uh, a little bit of a stint off um, and is also in California as a professor, um, a visiting scholar at the UC Davis uh, School of Law. Um, so I'm gonna start uh, our conversation by asking Julia to talk a little bit about why are we having this conversation now about temporary and permanent visas, about, uh, you know, the, we've talked a lot in the last year as President Trump has talked a lot about merit-based immigration, and we're talking here in our report about high-skilled immigration. Why is this issue happening right now, and what are the issues with the U.S. system that you think are driving that? Julia, over to you. Sure, yeah, and thank you so much for having me, and congratulations, Chris, and BBC on the report. Um, it's a really great compilation of you know, how temporary to permanent pathways work in other countries with lots of details. And as we've been thinking at the Migration Policy Institute about these pathways, it's really helpful to hear and to see these examples from other countries and think about what we can draw. Um, President Trump has kind of thrown open all kinds of questions on immigration policy, including questions about, you know, the value of immigration policy or of immigration kind of writ large and especially of lower skilled immigration. Um, and I think in this moment, you know, it kind of raises a really good question of how can we design our immigration policy in our national interests? So, you know, I think we think of Immigration Policy Institute, I think personally that immigration brings a lot of benefits to the United States, but it is worth thinking about how we can get the greatest benefit out of it. Um, and in thinking about that, you know, we recognize that a lot of parts of our immigration system are broken and our employment-based system is one of those pieces that's very broken. Chris kind of referred to this, but you know the um, the H-1B visa is really a big piece that's driving our permanent employment-based system. But we issue many, many more H-1B visas every year than there are transitions available. So many people who come on H-1B visas want to transition to the permanent system, um, but there are really big backlogs, especially because we have per country caps on our permanent system and not on the temporary system. So 
nationals from India in particular are facing enormous, maybe 50 year, maybe 150 year backlogs to try to adjust to permanent status. Um, the H-1B visa is also a very, in some ways, a narrow pathway for driving our employment-based immigration system. We know that 80% of people who are getting employment-based green cards are adjusting from other some other status in the United States, and Chris showed those great data showing that that's mostly H-1B. To a lesser extent, it's the L visa for intra-company transferees. But both of these visas are used primarily by workers in the IT industry and programming. And if we were design our, to, to design our immigration system from scratch, I don't think that we would you know, think of a system that primarily brings programmers and IT workers to the United States for permanent employment based visas. I think we would think about a greater variety of um, workers who could benefit our economy and bring a lot of strengths to our economy. So I think that's a big reason why it's worth rethinking it. Um, and as Chris also pointed out, the pathway from temporary status to permanent status is, is long and convoluted, and there are a lot of barriers along the way. Um, other countries do a much better job of, once they've graduated a talented foreign student, of giving them a clear and predictable pathway to be able to stay permanently in their country and, and obtain citizenship there. We put people through you know, optional practical training after they're a student through H-1B potentially a lot of H-1B renewals while they wait in line for a green card. And then eventually, if they find an employer willing to stick with the process with them, they can get the green card. But in the meantime, they spend a long time in a temporary status that can make them somewhat more exploitable. So having a more predictable pathway could serve immigrant workers and serve employers. So this is all to say that there's a lot that could be reformed about our system. There's a lot that's not working well in our employment-based system and in this transition from temporary visas to permanent visas, which is really how our system does work right now. Thank you, Julia. Um, I'm now going to ask Daniel Costa to, to weigh in. Daniel, what's your take on this merit-based immigration uh, conversation and, and what problems do you see with our current uh, temporary to permanent immigration systems? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I want to first say thanks to BBC for uh, including me in this discussion because it's something uh, that I really care about and I think it's really crucial, but also not an easy uh, issue to figure out. And I think uh, Chris's report did a really great job of uh, adding value here in terms of uh, being able to know what other countries do with their temporary uh, labor migration systems and, and kind of laying out the elements of them. Uh, it does a really good job of, of, of talking about the, the broad structural aspects of the programs in, in Europe and Canada and Obviously, a lot of work went into this, and there's a, a ton of citations to studies about the European system that uh, I look forward to reading while I'm, you know, trapped in my house for the foreseeable future. Um, uh, however, you know, I do have some quibbles with how the the U.S. system is presented, and and mainly that refers to the H-1B H-1B visa uh, in terms of some of the assumptions and assertions that are made, and, and I hope that uh, maybe we can get a chance to 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 get into that later on in the discussion. Um, uh, uh, and the, the one thing I, I thought that I didn't really uh, give a, a picture of uh, in, from the sort of macro aspect is just how prevalent temporary work visas are in the United States. You know, we're um, in, in this paper, we're really just talking about H-1B, but in general, uh, we're talking about 1.6 million full-time equivalent jobs. That's uh, just over 1% of the population. That's the OECD's estimate. And so um, uh, all of the workers in, in, in these different temporary visas, you know, face particular challenges. I'm guessing we'll probably get into that more too. And H-1B by itself is about half a million workers by my own count, and those are heavily concentrated in just a few occupations. Um, and you know the, the the paper focuses on college educated migrants and H-1B and uh, uh, and in, in the other countries and in general the the permanent visa system is very tilted already towards uh, college ed educated migrants and um, uh, I guess uh, from here I, I want to show a couple of slides that just uh, uh, talk about why further tilting it in that direction is probably misguided and I and I'm not saying that BPC necessarily advocates for this I don't believe that it does. Uh, but Republicans writ large and Jared Kushner, who is, uh, you know, devising a new plan that will make proposals based uh, you know, along these lines, are essentially laser focused on on making the immigration system more merit based, which uh, really just means tilting it uh, towards uh, the college educated. So the slide that's um, up right now, this slide shows uh, the top uh, 25 fastest growing occupations. Uh, uh, that's uh, These are BLS projections from um, uh, going from 2018 to 2028. And I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, what it shows is that um, 
you know, 17 out of the top 25 don't require anything more than a high school diploma. Uh, and if you could maybe go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide shows that, um, you know, uh, out of these, uh, the top 10, the top 10 fastest growing occupations, six out of the top 10 have median wages that are less than $27,000 a year. So what that means to me is that, uh, you know, most of the future job growth is actually going to come from jobs that don't require a degree. Um, uh, and actually, maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, the next slide here just kind of shows that there isn't uh, going to be a big shift in the economy towards needing more jobs, uh, toward, towards more jobs that need more college grads. Um, as you can see, the uh, uh, currently 26.4% uh, of jobs require a college degree or more. That's going to go up uh, by uh, less than a percent to 27.2. Uh, for bachelor's degrees, it's 22% now. It's it's going to go up by half a percent to 22.5. So, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that we don't need skilled migrants, far from it, uh, but the terms and conditions uh, which they come under are, are kind of the issue for me and what the actual skill mix should be. If there are going to be labor shortages, it's much more likely that they're going to be in these occupations that don't require as much education and that pay low wages. So I think that a lot of the focus uh, should really be on improving job quality. And so if we are bringing in migrants to these jobs uh, where there are sh uh, shortages, uh, we need to make sure that they're paid well, that they're part of a union, that they get benefits. Um, and, uh, and, and that also goes for the, uh, for the higher skilled uh, jobs as well. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Chris, let me ask you, uh, you know, when we were working on this report, I mean, we focused, uh, as Daniel said, on the high skilled. Um, and to, to be clear, BPC also supports um, immigration at the, at the lower end of the skill spectrum as well. We think that our, across our economy, there are needs that, that are unmet that, that immigration can help with. But one of the reasons we were looking at this is, is just because the conversation is a lot around the high skilled immigrants. Chris, do you want to talk about how we pick the countries? and why we focused on the high skill in the report. I think it's easier to do a one to one to one comparison when you're looking at different immigration systems. Um, it's not to say that you couldn't do that. Actually, MPI, uh, Julian company actually released a great report that kind of looked at mid to lower skilled immigration in some various European countries. But I think it's easier to sort of be able to sort of see how different countries approach high skilled immigrants and sort of the ways that they're able to sort of assess their credentials, then subsequently see whether or not um, they can come to a country on temporary status and eventually become permanent residents. Um, you also sort of see some similar trends and sort of un understanding how do you assess credentials, um, you know, how you apply labor market tests and the variations and convergences that you see there. Uh, Basically, it was just easier to do an international comparison. Um, I think when you're looking at mid to lower skilled immigration, um, then it gets a little bit trickier because sort of each each economy, um, they're mid to low skilled. There's some commonalities across all of them, such as domestic work or hospitality work. But sometimes you might have issues related to agriculture, for instance, um, that might be present in one country, let's say the United States, and say comparing it to Germany or Sweden. Um, or Denmark, which might have their own respective industries. So I think that you sort of see commonality in pathways for high skilled immigrants. But I think I, I agree with Daniel that that's not just simply the only focus in these countries or in our own country that you do need to be able to be taking a look at uh, mid or low skilled immigrants. Or I think we like to say, um, you know, high capacity uh, immigration but for folks who maybe don't have the education, but clearly are very skilled in the professions. It's not easy to pick fruits. In, in the fields. That's not just something that you just walk into a field and do. There's there's a lot more aptitude there. So I think that's the reason why we looked at what we looked at, but we don't, um, we definitely look at mid and skill. We understand and, and definitely recognize the importance of that in any immigration system and economy. Julia, I'm gonna bring you back in. Um, so it's interesting though that most countries do have some sort of focus on high skilled migration, temporary to permanent. Uh, it seems to be a, a focus of their systems. If you look at the United States overall immigration system compared to a lot of the other developed world, um, you know, we focus a lot on family-based immigration, but within our employment system, as, as Daniel said, it's, it's skewed toward higher skilled. Many other countries focus almost exclusively on that um, as, a, as a goal of their system. Why do you think that is? Why are countries focused on this high-skilled migration uh, as, as part of their immigration systems? 
So, you know, high school demigration, I think the research would suggest brings greater or clearer benefits to the country. High school immigrants aren't going to be needing um, government benefits or government assistance. They'll be paying into tax systems at high rates. The research shows that bringing in high school immigrants tends to boost economic growth because you know, the workers are high earning, they're also more likely to start businesses and employ others. Um, so there's a clear economic benefit from high school immigration. You know, in the United States, we were initially, the H-1B program was intended to bring in high school immigrants to complement Americans who at the time were less likely to have a college education than they are now. Um, and so it kind of brings a different picture as countries, as education has risen all around the world and developed countries have really high rates, you know, of, high, of college graduation and of um, going to graduate school as well. It, it kind of mixes up the picture. But I think the economic benefits are of high school immigration are very clear and that's why that's a less contentious part of the system. Um, countries often bring in lower skilled immigrants through their temporary systems and that's a way to kind of bring in people and try to get the work contributions of those workers without really bringing them in as families and as people who may at times need government support, who may be less of a fiscal benefit to the country. Um, who may be paying less in taxes and, you know, may bring other complications or be more likely to overstay visas, that type of thing. So I think it's partly just because of the economic benefits and it's easier to sell to the public too because of those economic benefits. So Daniel, let me let me ask you now, um, you know, could you I mentioned... Add, or, could, I add a footnote, could I just add a footnote to that? Like I, I completely, completely, agree, completely, I'll do it quick. I completely agree with Julia with what she's saying. I think I think it's uh, driven by this uh, understanding that because uh, high skilled workers have a college uh, degree, you know, they're going to pay more in taxes, so the the fiscal balance is is positive. But I but I, I think that's slightly misguided because I think that if we're talking about having an employment based migration system, I think it should be driven by feeling labor shortages. And I think in the U.S. we need better uh, you know mechanisms and systems to uh, identify labor shortages, like the Migration Advisory Committee in the U.K. or uh, you know, shortage occupation lists that are developed. And I think that that's one other way that you can tell to the public, hey, uh, the workers who are coming in are complementary because they're actually going to fill labor shortages uh, rather than just saying, well, they have a college degree, so they'll pay more in taxes. But, you know, you, you, you might have a, a PhD doctor who can't get a job and has to uh, drive a taxi. And so um, I think that, you know, that that, that there's, it, there's more to it. I think, yeah, and if I can just jump in on there. Um, Definitely the European countries, for instance, do manage uh, labor shortage lists. Um, for instance, in Denmark, there's something called the fast track scheme, which is essentially that if you have a, um, an employer who is in, is in a field with labor shortages, they can actually get certified by the Danish government that they can bring on a um, non-citizen uh, third country worker uh, to work for them um, and contract them very quickly but largely because they registered with this short labor shortage program and Canada also had something similar as well. Um, so other countries definitely do sort of are able to sort of assess where the labor shortages are and are able to adjust their immigration systems or at least have programs that can address them. That's certainly a, a continuity that I didn't bring up in, in the presentation, but you know, is, um, is hinted at as well. And I think Julia MPI also uh, published something along those lines as well. So I'm going to go back to Daniel um, because you, you said something interesting and Julia mentioned this as well, is that in many countries, the lesser skilled migration flows tend to be focused just on temporary migration and not so much permanent migration. There's more emphasis of temporary to permanent in the high skilled. Again, the presumption being that high skilled immigrants are, are going to be economically more beneficial for the country. Um, Daniel, your your previous slides and the, the research you did did say that a lot of the job openings are in the lesser skilled occupations that pay less. That kind of fuels a lot of the conversation about how there's probably more competition between immigrants and natives at the lower end of the skill spectrum. And that's maybe why they countries rely more on temporary programs there than than bringing more residents in. What's your what's your what's your response to those kind of uh, uh, issues that people that people raise in these systems? Well, I mean, uh, it's generally true that if uh, you know, if uh, if 
your workers are going to be substitutable and uh, it's probably going to be more at the lower end of the spectrum because a lot of those jobs don't require much education and training. But I think that just uh, means that we have to do a much better job of, uh, of actually determining where there's a shortage there. And um, uh, you know, if there's a real shortage, then 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 you bring in immigrants to fill to fill those jobs. And when they come in, I think they should, uh, because they're filling a labor shortage that's been credibly demonstrated, they should be on a fast track to permanent residence. They should probably come in as permanent residents. That 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 would probably be better. But at least coming in some quick provisional way so that they can um, get out of uh, the temporary status, which in a low wage job. And having a temporary status, I think, creates a lot of vulnerabilities uh, because the way the system is set up, if you're in a temporary visa, you're usually tied to your employer. If you get fired, you become deportable, and that means that you're not going to speak up, speak up about uh, workplace abuses. And so, uh, I, I think that is a challenge, and that's why I think we really need to focus on having some credible way to uh, to determine where where the labor shortages are, so that the public. Can, uh, can can feel better about the fact that the people who are coming in to fill those lower wage jobs are actually complementing the workforce. Um. So Julia, let's go back to something you said earlier about the, the, the mismatch in numbers between temporary to permanent. And Chris's slide showed that, you know, there's sort of one slim pathway in the US system that you can go from temporary to permanent in the high skilled it's even harder in the lower skill that we're not talking about here. Um, but, you know, Canada, even though it also has parallel systems, has a couple more ways that you can more easily get from temporary to permanent. And of course, the European systems tend to be kind of continuous. But what's the big bottleneck in the U.S. system? Why are we why are we so 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 narrowly focused, narrow, narrow pathways? Yeah, the, the big bottleneck is that there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of temporary work visas issued every year, um, but there are only 140,000 employment based green cards that are available, and actually about half of those are going to the spouses and children of workers. So it's really more like 70,000, you know, uh, green cards available for workers every year. So the numbers are just completely mismatched. Um, there's many, many more people who are on those temporary visas who really wish to stay in the United States. And as you were saying, Teresa, on the low skilled side, it's really difficult. There are just 5,000 green cards available for lower skilled workers, um, you know, and a small number for middle skilled workers. So those who are coming on um, on lower skilled temporary pathways, anyway, they're supposed to return home. They're not supposed to have the intent to stay in the United States, but even if they wish to, the numbers aren't there in the green card system for them. The other big problem is the per country cap. So there is no per country cap on our temporary visa programs, and we know that the H-1B visa is very heavily used by Indian nationals. Um, but in our green card system, no country can get more than 7% of the green card. So that creates a very, as I think you said, Teresa, a very tight funnel that we're trying to put these big numbers of green card, of temporary visa holders, especially from India, into a very small number of green cards that are available. And this leads to the really long weeks that we have. Um, if I can, I'd also like to talk about this shortage issue just a little bit. I mean, I think it's a really interesting idea that a lot of countries have developed these shortage occupation lists, and it makes sense that if you're trying to avoid competition between foreign workers and domestic workers, you want to identify where there just aren't enough workers available. Um, that's an interesting idea, and I think it makes sense, but it's really difficult to study. Um, the economic data that, that researchers use or that policymakers use to develop those shortage occupation lists are inherently delayed. And right now is a perfect example. You know, if you were, if I were to look at the economic data today and say, where in the United States are there shortage occupations? Those may be occupations where everybody is being laid off because of the crisis that's just hit. Um, so it's difficult to assess that properly. Um, many countries also rely on consultations with employers and with labor to try to update their understanding and get a more nuanced picture of the shortages. But it's just a really difficult process. And I would argue that there could be benefit for bringing in workers even where there aren't shortages, especially on the higher skill side, where we know that people tend to innovate, they tend to create jobs, they tend to bring economic benefits um, and bring other strengths to the United States, even if there isn't necessarily a shortage, because especially higher skilled workers can kind of navigate through the labor market and find their own opportunities and find a way to not be competing with US workers to create opportunities. So I think Shortages have their place, but I don't think that should be the only way that we drive our employment-based immigration system. I, I think you're right, Julia, but I would just say one one thing is there's a mechanism that you can use, and that is ensuring that the wages the migrants get paid, you know, are high enough to uh, to, so so that um, uh, 
they don't put downward pressure on the wages of the workers who are already there in those occupations. And the program that we have now, the H-1B, doesn't do a very good job of that, in my opinion. And that's but that's something else you could consider as part of that mix. So let me bring Chris on that point, because I was going to say, Chris, can you talk a little bit about the differences that you saw in how the labor market tests are done uh, in the European systems versus the Canadian or American systems? Um, one of the things that you found, as you mentioned, is that the labor market tests at the beginning of the temporary um, visa side of things are, are rather strict and stringent, um, but there's less of a, 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 a labor market test when you're transitioning from temporary to permanent, whereas in the U.S. side, and somewhat in the Canadian side, there's there's duplicate processes. Maybe it's easier up front, harder to get to permanence. Can you describe some of those differences? Yeah, so yeah. one of the more interesting systems that I found was Sweden, which essentially, under the Swedish system, if you get a job offer from an employer, your professional and academic um, credentials aren't actually fully assessed. They're, they just kind of let the employer determine whether or not that's effective. But in in, 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 as a result, though, what they decided to do is actually have a very, uh, a pretty stringent test where um, in some instances, for instance, you have to be paying uh, a minimum level salary, I believe it's $63,000, um, or you also need to get a uh, letter from a labor union if you're, a, you're, you're hiring a uh, third country national for a position um, in, a, in, a, in, in a field that has, that's, you know, basically has strong labor uh, labor organization and the high representation of labor unions there. Um, that's the way that sort of Sweden does it and sort of either having wages or getting certifications from labor unions. Um, and those are just two models that they use. Um, Denmark, uh, Denmark actually has th at least, they have 17 different pathways to be able to enter the country to work on a temporary, uh, on a temporary basis for high skilled employees, depending on their occupation, their fields. But the ones that we looked at, the three schemes is what they call these pathways. Um, one is labor shortage lists. Another one is paying a minimum salary. Also, I believe in around the 60,000s for in, in equivalent US dollars. Um, and, and some other ones are essentially, you know, in basically doing a lot of recruitment to determine whether or not there'll be displacement. Um, Germany is interesting because the German model is emphasizes really strongly credentials. Um, you really need to have your credentials recognized by the German government um, in order to be able to basically get a temporary permit to work as a third country national, um, even if you have a job offer. And so that they use credentials as a way of assessing it. It is worth noting that in the German system, they are actually loosening up those that process. They actually are introducing a reform or have reformed and introduced this month where it's a little bit easier to have your credentials recognized because they realized they weren't able to um, recruit or hire enough high skilled immigrants to meet their labor market needs. So certainly that there are there is like you know much more hard, uh, stringent or uh, more rigorous process up front, um, but some of the countries are recognizing that that might be getting in the way of being able to actually uh, bring on more high skilled workers for their economies. So Daniel, you were talking earlier about the concerns that you have with the usage of temporary visas to have workers enter the, the country and the disconnect between temporary and permanent and your preference for permanent visas. But what about the arguments that's, that Julia had about, you know, our economy is not static, but when you admit somebody permanently, they're permanently a part of the labor force. Um, you know, the idea of temporary worker visas is somewhat that they can be more responsive to the labor markets and where there are necessary shortages as that changes. What's your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I, I think I, I think there's something to that. I think uh, uh, the, the problem for me is that th that we have so many examples of temporary work visas not being so great for the workers. They seem to be really great for the employees because they have a lot of control over the workers. Um, you know, if uh, if there is a role for temporariness in the immigration system, I think it needs to be uh, some sort of a trial period, perhaps for for an employer. Maybe it's a year, maybe it's eighteen months, where the uh, the employer gets to see if the the you know the worker uh, is is exactly what they need, and the and the worker gets to to try out living in the United States. But once you get past that period, that's uh, that, that's a lot of time uh, of being in an exploitable temporary status. And we have plenty of uh, uh, examples of where workers are trafficked or where they're underpaid. 
Um, and so I think uh, I, I, I think that uh, if there's a role for temporariness, I think it needs to be limited just because of uh, the experience we have. I mean, there's countless reports from the news media and government audits about the problems and the vulnerabilities that temporary uh, migrant workers have. And I, I just want to say I don't need to say anything about it because Julia already ex explained what's in the chart that we have up on the screen. But that is just an illustration of the growth in the, the temporary work visas. As you can see the, the green section at the very bottom uh, is uh, the number of uh, employment based permanent immigrant visas that allow people to stay permanently and be on a path to citizenship, the green cards. Uh, and, and since the 1990 Immigration Act, you can see that all of the temporary work visas uh, and, uh, and, the, and for the spouses has just grown uh, exponentially, essentially. And so um, it, it really shows a mismatch and shows that our, our system is really geared towards temporariness and not towards letting people stay permanently. Yeah, um, just to make two points on that. Um, in Sweden, uh, I believe after two years, you are able to switch employers if you're, I believe, in the same occupation, um, in the same field. Uh, so that there is some flexibility in some of these systems where you don't have to be a tied, tied to your employer the entire time, um, but you certainly want to be in the same occupation, in the same field, um, because if you actually switch out the, the so I believe in Sweden, it's five years that you're able to apply for permanent status. If you actually switch out, the clock resets and you actually now have to wait an additional five years to be able to apply for permanent status. So countries do recognize this and they have different ways of, of managing it. And in terms of sort of, you know, bad actors of employers um, in Canada, that there is a, a list of, of employers who are prohibited from issuing temporary visas uh, and, and hiring uh, non-citizens, uh, you know, and these are bad actors, either they violated labor conditions or, um, or labor laws or immigration laws. Um, and that there is a list that's being maintained. So certainly countries are finding ways to sort of address these issues uh, in different ways. And it's something that I think is recognized in other countries um, and it's worth noting. So Julia, you you have been doing work on exactly this issue of what it, what would a temporary to permanent system for the United States look like? Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different issues at play here. It's balancing uh, the idea that you want workers who can come in and contribute to the economy and will be good permanent residents in the future versus the temporary and sort of uh, un uncertain nature of the future of the economy. So you're making your best guesses and, you know, mitigating the potential for abuse of, of workers in the system. So what have, what is your organization thought about as sort of best practices or policies that we might look to for that? Yeah, so Right, we've been thinking a lot about this. Um, our proposal, kind of along the lines of an earlier conversation, would bring in workers across the skill spectrum. So the idea is that there would be a, basically a temporary to permanent pathway. We were calling it a provisional visa. We're rethinking the name of that, but um, basically that would allow workers in for a set period of time. Um, they could renew that visa, as, as is the case in many of the countries that Chris profiled, and then after a certain period could self-sponsor for a green card in the United States, but employers would be the ones selecting temporary workers up front. And we think that's really important because the United States has done a really good job of um, capitalizing on the skills of the workers that we select through our employment-based system because employers are selecting workers that they know will be good employees or they highly suspect will be good employees. And we don't, through our employer-led system, see the levels of brain waste of people working at jobs that don't meet their skills and qualifications that other countries have seen. So the employer would select the worker up front um, there would be this, you know, provisional tryout kind of period, and then after a time, the worker could adjust to permanent status. And I think to Daniel's point there, and Chris's point as well, there are, you know, really key pieces of the design that can make this work better, you know, for the foreign workers and make them less exploitable. And one is the ability to change employers within the United States, whether or not that worker would be um, limited to the occupation for which they are selected is a kind of open question in our design, but we think it's really important that workers could change employers within the United States if they have an employer that's not treating them fairly or they find just a better opportunity. We really want to facilitate upward mobility of workers over time in the United States. That's an issue with the H-1B is that workers often can't be promoted without going through a lot of red tape and processes and maybe restarting clocks. 
especially if they're being promoted from, say, a programming job to being a manager of other programmers. That can be really difficult. So we want to facilitate that upward mobility. Um, and then we think that the self-sponsorship for a green card is really important because, again, that's a really big problem with our H-1B system is that workers, especially if they're you know, Indian or Chinese nationals and in a big backlog, are waiting years and years with the same employer who they're dependent on to sponsor them for the green card. And that gives the employer a lot of power over that worker. So we want to avoid that situation. And we think it, you know, there should be a tryout period because our economy is in flux, you know, not just the current crisis, but also with trends in automation. We don't know exactly what jobs are going to look like in the future. You know, Daniel showed that the Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that lower skilled jobs are, you know, going to create the most job growth over the coming years. But we actually don't know if that's true. We don't know how the automation trends are going to play out and whether some of those lower skilled jobs are as automatable as some people predict. So, you know, we're not really sure. Employers may bring in workers and they may not have the soft skills or they may not have the, the hard skills to be a success in the U.S. labor market. So that trial period is a way to find out that somebody really is a good fit with our economy before putting them on a path to citizenship by giving them permanent residence. So those are kind of the broad strokes of the idea. So Chris, I'm going to go back to you. And one of the things that you mentioned is that, you know, in the U.S. system, we have a labor market test at the beginning of a temporary program. And, and Daniel, I'm sure will will say that the at least for H-1Bs, it's not a true labor market test. It's a labor condition attestation, which is a lot lower standard. But they're pretty high standards in Europe. But when they switch, when people switch from temporary to permanent, it's not necessarily looking then at whether or not they're still feeling a labor market um, niche so much as have they integrated into the society um, are, or are they eligible to be integrated? Do you want to talk a little bit about that distinction between where we are in the U.S. and how the Europeans do it? Yeah, that's actually interesting because historically in the United States, as uh, folks who have seen a loved one go through the citizenship process, uh, if they know that or know somebody else who did, is that the citizenship process is when you sort of have these integration tests on uh, American civics, English language, and so forth. Um, fluency with, with, with English. If you look at the European countries, though, um, a lot of this actually happens at the permanent stage. So in, in Canada, in Germany, Sweden, Denmark, all those countries actually have language requirements where you have to basically demonstrate, um, you know, fairly moderate language fluency capacities in each of those countries. Um, that's kind of the base level for this. But then some countries take it a lot further. I think in the report, I talk about the Danish model as the integrationist model, because in addition to uh, various requirements that you have to fulfill, one of them being Danish, um, there's sort of a, a core set of requirements. Uh, you have to be admissible. You have to exhibit self-sufficiency, have a job. Obviously, if you're in a high school profession, that's not an issue. Um, you know, you also have to fulfill an additional set of supplementary requirements, some of them actually being, uh, so for instance, um, working, like, you know, basically working with a Danish civil society group or um, demonstrating uh, integration with, with Danish civil society or knowing uh, Danish uh, history. Um, and it's so the thing is, that's where it's interesting because of this whole idea of a trial period, um, the question is whether or not this individual has made strides towards integrating into the country and whether or not then that individual merits uh, access to, to permanent status to live in the country indefinitely. So I think that that's, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. And obviously it's, it, there's a lot of controversy around this in the United States because in the merit-based uh, plan that Jared Kushner uh, proposed or worked with with the White House, um, there is a integrationist test for, I believe our own correctly, individuals who um, want to even apply for the merit-based system. Uh, they have to go through that in order to apply. Um, obviously, that I think that's significantly further than any, any of these uh, approaches that these other countries use. Um, but I think that that's, I think, important to note that there, you know, these countries do sort of have a trial period and then they want to get a sense of the individual if they, um, if they want to uh, be a part of the society or not. And that's, that's how they do it, and, and it's quite different from us. And uh, I think the last point is, is, is whether or not that's a, an approach that we want to take um, or whether we want to maintain what we already have um, when assessing integration into the country.
So Daniel, I'm going to go back to you now. What's what? What do you think is the the right sort of balance here? Um, you know, again, we talked earlier about the whatever labor market test or economic requirement is in place at a temporary visa stage. Conditions may be different at the permanent stage. That's sort of one of the reasons, or one of the articulated reasons, why we have a, a parallel track and dual labor market tests in our system. Whereas the Europeans are saying, well, look, if you've managed to work and live and work in our country for several years already, you're essentially already part of our labor market, so we don't need to do other tests. And what we're really looking is, are you going to be a good citizen down the line? What's your take on that distinction? Well, I mean, I think this discussion has pointed out the absurdity of the U.S. system. It's uh, it's essentially a fast track, uh, you know, to get an H-1B. The uh, Chris's report, one of the things I disagreed about was that he talks about a uh, labor condition application as a labor market test and says in the end that it's one of the policy considerations that uh, you know policymakers in the U.S. should think about whether or not it makes sense to have these two tests. But the LCA at the front end of the H-1B is not really a labor market test. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, something that almost no human actually looks at. It's almost uh, 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 automatic. The, the Labor Department's uh, Office of the Inspector General has uh, has basically called it a rubber stamp, and there's no requirement that uh, employers have to look for U.S. workers before they're hired, they hire an H-1B. So there's actually no uh, employers don't have to prove that there's a labor shortage before they hire an H-1B. So that's uh, that's one issue. But then, of course, then you have the H-1B work in the United States for six years, and then and then you do a labor shortage determination there there, and you have to find out whether or not there's a U.S. worker who will take. Uh, that job, I think that uh, that that makes uh, virtually no sense. You should have that real labor shortage determination in the front, uh, and then and then uh, the worker should uh, be able to quickly transition into into permanent resident status. And I think that's uh, 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 thanks to you know Chris's report. It's really showcasing the difference between the European model and the U.S. model. The the U.S. model is really uh, an employer-driven, employer-controlled model, whereas in Europe. You know, after you're uh, after you're in the country four, five, eight years, uh, you've you've got a, a fairly decent path to becoming permanent, and the worker controls that, and I think that's really important. And uh, and and regarding this question of temporariness, I think uh, the one other footnote I wanted to add is that you know the, the OECD uh, looked at uh, the length of uh, temporary work visas across the OECD region, and it found that you know only about you know 12 or 13 percent are less than 12 months. Uh, about a fifth are one to two years, and about uh, you know uh, about a third are for uh, two to five years. And so the vast majority uh, of these temporary work visas across the OECD region are valid for more than one year. So what, what does that really mean? Does that, well, you know, what does temporary mean? How is temporary two, three, four, five, six years? Um, and, and who does it benefit, I guess, is, is the question. Uh, are these really just permanent jobs that we're just calling temporary for some reason because that allows employers to, uh, uh, to, to have workers who are disposable? Uh, um, so that, you know, that raises a lot of questions for me. What does temporary really mean? And and I don't think that as a general principle, we should be filling temporary or I don't think we should be filling permanent jobs with temporary visas. And I think that's that's going on quite a lot. OK, so we're going to we're going to shift over to some Q&A. Um, we've got some questions in the queue and uh, this first one asks uh, many passive U.S. administrations, including our current administration, often stresses the country wants more legal high skilled immigrants. But it's very, and this person says it's very difficult for high skilled and often US educated immigrants to even find employment uh, in the temporary schemes in F1 optional practical training or H1B, um, let alone a path to citizenship. So how do we square these circles? I'm thinking this has a lot to do, um, one with the, the perception by many employers that are reluctant to hire immigrants, that it's an onerous process and costly. Um, but also, how you know, Julia, you talked about employers maybe being the best judge of their own needs and, and labor shortages. Um, I'm going to go to Julia with this one first. What do you think about what this person is saying about the disconnect between sort of the rhetoric and what maybe immigrants are seeing as reality on the ground? Right. So most of our, um, or many of our temporary visas are for higher skilled immigrants. Our permanent system is for higher skilled immigrants, but that doesn't mean it's easy to find a pathway. The, the H-1B visa is for so-called specialty occupations and 
this administration has been kind of tinkering behind the scenes with the definition of that. So not all higher skilled jobs qualify. Um, and there are kind of, you know, established pathways over time of which companies are savvy about how to get their H-1B workers and how to get their applications approved. And other employers may not be so savvy with that process. So that can make it hard if a foreign worker, you know, finds an employer who wants to hire them. That doesn't necessarily make it easy to get that H-1B visa. There's also, you know, greater demand for the visas than there is supply. So there's a lottery and so you have to win that lottery to get your visa. So it's a really complicated process. Um, there's also the, the fact that foreign workers may not, you know, always know, especially foreign students coming out of college, they might not be particularly savvy at navigating how to do a job search in the United States, how to find that employer, and employers have to go through red tape in order to hire foreign workers. And so even if an employer finds a foreign student a desirable worker, they might not want to have to deal with all of the processes that are required. And I think to go back to the conversation we were having about um, labor certification processes, that's, that is one of the problems. It makes sense to do the labor market testing at the point when the immigrant enters the labor market rather than six years down the line. But our current system is incredibly slow and not particularly effective necessarily at really testing whether there's a labor market need. So if we're going to do that testing up front, we have to make it workable. We have to make it possible for the employer to hire that worker in a reasonable amount of time so that they can fill that job and not just turn to a U.S. worker instead. I mean, maybe they should turn to a U.S. worker instead if there is one available. But if, you know, if that foreign worker brings unique talents that would benefit the country, there should be a process in place to kind of get through the, the immigration processes in a quick way so that that worker can join the labor market and contribute their talents to our country. So, Daniel, let me let me turn to you on that. I mean, our, our current labor market tests, to the extent they exist, at least in the permanent stage and, and for many of the temporary visas, if not H-1B, are individualized tests, right? It's, is there a U.S. worker who could be hired for this particular job by this particular employer vis-a-vis -vis the immigrant who's applying? And, uh, you know, in Chris's report and a lot of other systems, it's more of an economy-wide look at what are, quote-unquote, shortage occupations or potential areas, it, it may or may not be an, an actual individual labor market test. Your, your, your comments earlier about thinking that we should be doing more labor market testing up front. What's your, what's your thoughts on the distinction between sort of the individualized one, which as Julia said, can be really complicated versus a more generalized uh, labor market look? Uh, I mean, I think they're both valuable. I think the individualized one, obviously, is probably a better matching tool to make sure that uh, immigrants are going to succeed in the job that they're in. But I also think that the economy-wide one is uh, really important, especially in terms of uh, generating public support for immigration by showing where uh, 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 migrant workers, new migrant workers coming in will be complementary. So I, I kind of think uh, I kind of think you, the system needs to have both. You need to have uh, labor shortage determinations. And and what you would do there is uh, if an employer wants to hire a specific, uh, the employers would still be hiring for specific jobs. But if they were hired within a shortage determination, they would have a, you know, some sort of fast track access to hiring that migrant worker. Uh, and if they were hiring outside of a, a, a shortage occupation, you know, there, there, there's, you know, always going to be some shortages in some places at some times, but uh, the, somebody might need a specific worker for a place where there isn't a shortage occupation, uh, where there isn't a demonstrated shortage. So in that case, you would just have additional hoops for the employer to go through. When, and I think uh, the main hoop, which would maybe uh, eliminate the need for the other hoops, is having a high enough wage where, uh, uh, you know, a, a wage that is far enough above the median where the public uh, feels comfortable that, uh, you know, the immigration system isn't being used to degrade, degrade uh, wages and labor standards. So I'm going to ask you a question that, that gets asked often above me when that the, the wage floor uh, conversation comes up, which is, if you say that we want to make sure that we're hiring foreign workers in these jobs at higher wages, that's somewhat of a deterrent for an employer hiring somebody that they may not really need or trying to depress wages. But could it also mean that for an employer that really needs somebody, they end up paying an immigrant more than they're paying their U.S. workers? And how do you square that circle, Daniel? Well, if they're uh, uh, supposedly the system is being used to hire people with specialized skills and if uh, that they cannot find in the U.S. labor market, they're essentially 
asking the U.S. government for a public benefit to allow them to uh, hire somebody that's outside of the labor market because they need them, because they can't find somebody in the U.S. labor market. And that must mean, or it should mean, that that person has some specialized skills that are worth a premium. Otherwise, they would just hire somebody in the in the U.S. labor market. So I'm perfectly fine with saying the reason you're hiring somebody outside the labor market is because somebody here is not available. So they must be more skilled and talented than who's available. So they should be paid, you know, uh, uh, some X percent above whatever the median wage is because, of, uh, you know, supposedly they are uh, a more skilled worker. So our, our next question is getting at the, the, the place we find ourselves today, which is all fine and dandy to talk academically about labor market tests and making sure that the uh, system is addressing the economy. But we are, by all uh, estimates, looking at a steep recession uh, from the coronavirus and the impacts of what we're doing right now. Um, and our system, as everybody has talked about right now, is really not responsive to that economy. How do we... Um, talk about these issues uh, in, in a downturn economy when a lot of Americans are going to say, hey, look, we've just we've just had record 3.3 million unemployment claims today. What why are we even talking about bringing in more people? Julia, what do you what do you think about that that conversation right now? Right. The coronavirus and social distancing and the economic, you know, very rapid economic downturn that it's caused is kind of throwing everything up in the air in immigration. Um, you know, it's hard to know how this is all going to play out. During the Great Recession, what we saw was that, you know, more foreign workers in the United States opted to leave the United States because they had better opportunities back in their home countries or in other parts of the world. You know, especially we saw a slowing of immigration from Mexico and of unauthorized immigration. But with the coronavirus, I don't know what that's going to mean for the rest of the world. This is hitting us as a globe. Um, and many countries around the world are going to be as heavily affected as the United States is, and their economies will be as heavily affected as ours. So that throws a big question about push and pull factors that we've seen. You know, the U.S. hasn't had any trouble attracting foreign workers, and generally we have much more interest in there are jobs available or slots available in our system. But whether that's going to continue to be true, I don't know. I think it all goes to the pace of the recovery. How long are we all staying home and not shopping and not going out and, you know, how long are so many workers going to be out of work? Um, if it's a short amount of time, we may be able to recover quickly. If it's a long period of time, it could take a really long time. And what is our economy going to look like afterwards? It feels like small businesses are going to struggle. Large businesses may have an easier time. Um, so I think there's just a lot more questions. I'm not sure I have any answers. Our system, you know, we don't adjust our numbers based on the economy or based on you know, whether there's higher or lower unemployment, but our system does tend to self-correct just through how much interest there is in coming to a country when there's higher unemployment. Um, something that we at the Migration Policy Institute think should be in place is, you know, more systems to adjust visa numbers and visa categories based on economic conditions and other conditions, um, based on our national interests and how things are changing, and we should regularly review all of the parts of our system and have ways to adjust. Um, but you know, the system will adjust itself. So I think we'll just have to see how it plays out. That was really a non-answer, but I think there's so many questions right now that it's, it's hard to answer that. Chris, let me let me go to you and, and talk about a little bit about how other countries adjust their systems. Um, you know, we have caps that are set in statute that can't really be adjusted, certainly can't be adjusted up, um, nor adjusted down, although as Julia said, sometimes there are fewer applicants, although that hasn't been our experience recently. How do the European systems adjust? Do they have caps? Canada has what they call targets. Um, how do other systems adjust in, in these circumstances? Broadly, they don't have caps. And I think that that's important because essentially they have significantly more flexible systems than I think than the United States does. In some instances, like German Germany's new reform that I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there will be, I believe there's about 20,000 new high school visas for this new program. But writ large, a lot of their systems are, are not capped. And I think one of the reasons why um, is that when I talk about this with folks, it's like, how many, how many people do you know speak professional level Swedish in other countries outside of Sweden, right? And in many of these countries, obviously, when you're being assessed by an employer, you have to, one of the things that's going to be assessed is whether or not you can speak the language fluently in a professional level. And so I think things like this are what I, I like to call natural caps. 
that there's only so much, like the population of individuals who speak a language at a professional level fluency or is only so high. And then those individuals within that pool, those individuals can get the, the individual who get a job for a specific employer for a specific position is significantly lower, I think, than you see in the United States and Canada because English is, uh, you know, one of the most commonly spoken languages in the world. And, and it's, you know, it's a global language of business and commerce. Um, and so I think that that's something that, that needs to be considered that, you know, migrant flows, are, I think, are reflective sometimes of, of language capacity. Um, and that's, I think, where the United States and obviously Canada has that flexible with, with targets. And I think maybe that's where the United States needs to go because they are getting enough migrants. It's more of a question of, of uh, sorting and selecting the ones that work best for us. Um, and that means sometimes, I think, you know, having a system that can adjust the number of visas. Uh, compared to the ones in, in, in the European countries we looked at in the case studies. So Daniel, we have a question that's it to, for you. Um, it says, although not targeted, would you allow that family immigration offers a ready workforce for lower skilled jobs, especially in sectors like retail? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think uh, the family based uh, visas are, you know, uh, I mean, the majority of people coming in with green cards are actually through the family-based channels and so I do think that some percentage of them go into those jobs and we unfortunately don't know enough about the skill mix of people coming in on family-based visas. That's something that I would like to see uh, the U.S. look into more and learn more about. And then, of course, there's the refugee program, which we haven't talked about. Uh, a lot of refugees go into, uh, you know, key industries like, uh, uh, like meatpacking and uh, they are uh, they are uh, an important workforce that the uh, Trump administration has essentially uh, almost eliminated entirely. So um, I think that um, someday when we have a commission on immigration in the labor market, which is something that the Economic Policy Institute, my institute, has called for, as well as Julia's, the MPI has called for, and, and, and many other people have gotten on board with this idea, we need to have a, a commission that is looking at how immigration uh, intersects with the labor market and seeing which uh, you know which flows of workers are going to which occupations and that should be part of the discussion and the the analysis when we're looking at where labor shortages are and where we need immigration to uh, to fill labor shortages. So Julie, I'm going to turn to you on that. I mean, obviously the United States, the majority is, as Daniel said, green cards are family based. Sixty percent of our, our green cards are family based immigration. They're not directly tied to a job or a labor market shortage. They're coming in based on a family relationship, but they do participate in the labor market. How does that population of inflow skew when you're thinking about constructing an employment based system to target shortages? How do you uh, is Daniel is Daniel right that we just need to do a better job at looking at where immigrants are filling shortages and figuring that out from there? Yes, yeah, certainly a big piece of it is having more data and information. We have very little data where we can see how people came into the United States, which pathways they came through, and then how they're faring in labor markets. We know just because of, you know, the two thirds of our immigration system, our permanent immigration system is coming through the family based system. And we can see, you know, kind of broad scale the educational attainment of immigrants. We know that our family based system must be bringing in college educated workers. It's also bringing in a lot of middle skill and lower skilled workers for a wide variety of occupations. We know that immigrants tend to have high labor force participation rates, so we know that lots of family-based immigrants are working, but we don't really know if they're working up to their potential. If they're college educated, are they working in jobs that use their degrees and credentials? If they're middle skilled, are they finding good middle skilled jobs? Are they you know, progressing over time in the United States? There's a lot that we don't know about that. And then I think on the lower skilled end, there, there is a question of whether the family-based system is a good way to bring in these workers, even if that is not its intent, isn't its intent is family reunification, but is that the right way to bring in lower skilled workers? Because you know we have a pretty limited social safety net in the United States, and so family really plays that role, especially in immigrant families. Family can you know help new entrants kind of find their way in U.S. labor markets, connect them with employers, connect them with jobs. So is is family the right way to bring in lower skilled workers, or is the employment based system the right way to bring in lower skilled workers? Like what is a better way to select? those workers for our economy and for our country to make sure that they kind of have the safety net below them that is needed to kind of ensure their economic success. So yes, our family based system is bringing lots of workers across the skill spectrum. We kind of vaguely know that, but we should know a lot more about how they're doing and, and how they do relative to people who are selected directly for employment. I mean, in an ideal world, we could 
select similar kinds of workers through both systems and then see how they fare and see how their outcomes compare and use the, those data to inform the design of our system. So uh, a next question is a very interesting one. Uh, Daniel, in your slide of the, the growth in temporary visas, you, you, you use the Immigration Act of 1990 as, as sort of a, a marker there, which did greatly expand the number of temporary worker visas available and the categories uh, slightly increased the employment-based uh, system, but not, not so much. But if you look at our, our history of addressing immigration legislative changes since then, we haven't done a great job. And a lot of the recent discussion, I think, as we just said, is this discussion uh, writ large about, you know, how much should be family based, how much should be employment based. And then there's the whole question of the undocumented who are already in the U.S. labor market uh, to one extent or another. How do you guys see the conflation of these issues helping or hurting our ability to make the changes that we're that we're that we're talking about here? And, and Daniel, I'll start with you and then we'll kind of go across. Uh. I'm not sure I understand the, the premise of the conflation part. Uh, are you saying that uh, that we see all of these different streams of immigration as the same? They get thought of as being the same? Um, I'm, the, the question asks that the large increase in temporary employment visas in Immigration Act of 1990 compared to those before then seems to have led to the problem that in the 30 years, the backlogs, but there hasn't been much movement to address the problems. Um, partly due to the increasing polarization and the linkage of documented and undocumented immigration amongst others. And they're saying they'd like to hear the thoughts of the panel. I mean, we're focusing a lot on the legal immigration system, but the politics of the day talk a lot about undocumented workers and, and, and uh, you know, irregular migration. Um, do, you, do you think that that focus on that has hurt our ability to really have these kind of legal immigration discussions? I think that's maybe another way to put it. Uh, probably yes, but at the same time, but, but, you know, I think that, uh, because the current unauthorized population, which makes up 5% of the labor force virtually have no labor rights in practice, I do think that it's the most pressing issue that we need to figure out first and foremost. I think that's true. Um, but at the same time, I do think, um, you know, when, when, uh, comprehensive immigration reform has been on the table that it's included a legalization program for them. The legalization has not been uh, the the most difficult part to figure out. That's That's been, uh, I mean, at least according to the people who have been involved in this, you know, uh, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Durbin said this in a hearing and Leon Fresco, who wrote the 2013 Comprehensive Immigration Bill, they, they basically said that the hammering out the parts about legal, legalizing uh, the undocumented population took virtually no time and it what took time uh, to figure out was the H-1B. <laughs> they said 85% of the time that they spent on this comprehensive immigration bill to completely remake the immigration system was spent on just figuring out how the H-1B was going to work. And so, uh, so I, I do think it's an issue, but I, I do think that uh, it's not one, uh, the unauthorized population is not one that's hard to figure out. You just need a quick legalization that is broad uh, and puts them on a path to citizenship. But it, um, but uh, I do think that a lot of the uh, discourse and fighting around that has has uh, left us with uh, less space to talk about how to design a smart uh, labor migration system. So, Chris, I'm going to turn to you on this one. Um, you know, the European countries have had their own issues with migration in the last several years, and uh, it's politicized over there as well. Um, but in terms of the legal immigration system, is there the same controversy in in Europe with their legal immigration systems or in Canada as we see here? I don't think so, to be honest. I mean, in Europe, the European migration crisis or the, the crisis of asylum seekers just arriving there in large numbers um, completely subsumed the entire debate around immigration. Um, but I feel like because of the scope of that problem and the reaction that you saw from individual EU member states and the EU writ large, um, that it was so focused on that, that sort of legal immigration reforms or legal immigration writ large was kind of just ignored, to be honest. It wasn't necessarily ignored because there, they were still, there's still policies that are being adopted, ways that member states, EU member states are tweaking their policies. Um, but it doesn't, I don't think it has nearly the same um, emotional resonance or I think controversy as it does when you're talking about 
the regular immigration into uh, Europe um, or the arrivals of the continued arrivals of asylum seekers um, in Europe. Um, so I think it's interesting because whereas here in the United States, the debate has always been around, at least pub the public debate has focused on the undocumented and how we deter the arrivals of undocumented immigrants and what we do with the undocumented. Um, in Europe, of course, it was the arrivals of asylum seekers, which we're having that little bit here in the United States now. But that was sort of subsumed in the conversation. But the legal immigration discussion was sort of happening at a lower level, or at least more hidden away. And so it, it, it just doesn't have the same level of um, electricity as it does when you're talking about, um, you know, primarily humanitarian migrants and irregular migrants arriving to, to the EU and its member states. So Julia, turning to you, um, you know, that you focused a lot on legal immigration, obviously, you know, what's your thought about sort of the, the political debate and, and where it's gone on this? What do you think are, you know, as, as Daniel said, in, the, in 2013, we did comprehensive immigration reform. The hardest negotiated parts were the legal immigration system. I personally was involved in negotiations in 2005 and six and seven and eight, and I can uh, say the same thing, that the, the most hardest and detailed and hard fought over provisions were the legal immigration system. Why do you think it's so hard? Yeah, first, I think that as Chris was saying about Europe, you know, the debate here has been so consumed with arrivals of asylum seekers at the southwest border. That's where our national attention has gone. And I think both that and the large size of our unauthorized immigrant population, even if it's slowly declining, you know, it is big. That's kind of lost the faith of the American people and our government's ability to manage migration. So that makes it difficult to have these conversations because people just start with the, the assumption that the government is going to do it wrong or there's no good way to manage it or we're going to screw it up again or lead to a large unauthorized immigrant population no matter what we do again. So I think that's part of it. Into the nitty gritty, I mean, it's a smaller set of people who are really focused on the legal immigration conversation. And there are some very strong positions in, among the people who are involved in those conversations and very different understandings of, you know, what should be the goal of immigration? You know, should it be just to bring in workers for shortages or should it be kind of to boost our vitality overall to, you know, affect the, the age distribution of our population and of workers to address the fact that we're an aging population? to bring in people who can, you know, just grow the size of our economy. If we bring in more immigrants of any kind, our economy is going to grow and some people see that as a benefit. So there are very different orientations. Of course, there are always business labor debates that happen in these legal immigration conversations. So I think it gets contentious in that. And, and we talked about some of the details of design, you know, seemingly small details about labor condition applications or labor certification processes can have really big impacts on on U.S. workers, on foreign workers, on the rights of those workers, on labor exploitation, all kinds of things. So you get quickly really far into the weeds versus a broad principle, I think, that you know many Americans, not all, but many believe that we should legalize unauthorized immigrants and bring them out of the shadows, given how integrated many have become. So I think it's just there's a lot more policy weeds to get into. Um, but the bigger frame is that you know we haven't shown as a country that we can really get control of immigration and that makes it hard to have that conversation and you see that with our you know presidential debates all of our attention has been turned away from that right now it feels like but in the debates on the democratic side there really hasn't been talk about legal immigration and chris did a great review of their of the plans that the candidates had put forward and they're thinking a lot about the southwest border about asylum about unauthorized immigrants um, about daca and tps but not about legal immigration it just hasn't risen up in our national conversation so that leads to another question that we have. A, a questioner says, what might it take for the U.S. to adopt uh, measures that could protect temporary workers, such as those Chris mentioned in Europe? Um, our U.S. immigration model has had a foundation of exploitation. Da Daniel would agree with that. Um, so how could we build this model? Now, I know, Daniel, you mentioned the idea of, a, of an expert panel uh, that would do some of this. And Julia noted that as we've tried to do this in the past via legislation, it's been basically detailed negotiations with legislators between labor interests and employer interests. Um, do you think that that uh, external panel basically pitching it to an outside expert group might be a way to avoid some of the political dynamics of this and, and move forward? Um, yes, I, I mean, I do think that's, that's one way to uh, 
depoliticize the debate. Some of the conversations I've had with the Migration Advisory Committee in uh, the United Kingdom, they basically said, look, uh, when you when you when you lay out all of the elements of uh, what's being considered in making a decision about a labor shortage, and then you publish it and it's public, uh, people on both sides of the debate can point to it and say, well, that's what the evidence is. And unfortunately, we don't have that in here now. Uh, we have not. We have data that's not very good on immigration, first of all. And then second of all, we have just people lobbying Congress about, about the programs. And that gives uh, the people who are, who are powerful lobbyists uh, a disproportionate amount of power because you know why why shouldn't you believe what the Chamber of Commerce says? So um, I mean I think there's uh, that that is one uh, element of the system that I think uh, we need to 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 implement. But there are other things that can be done. I mean I think we need to broadly revise uh, temporary labor uh, or temporary work program uh, rules uh, and have better better labor market assessments, as we said, have um, higher wage rules and better wage rules so that um, uh, the public can feel confident that uh, the programs are not being used to put downward pressure on wages and labor standards. Uh, temporary migrant workers need to have the ability to, to switch employers, especially in cases where uh, there are abuses and exploitation involved. There needs to be much more transparency in uh, recruitment and job offers. Uh, uh, workers uh, in a home country before they leave need to know that the, the job offer that they have is legitimate. And then, as I've mentioned already, I think there needs to be a quick path to uh, lawful permanent residence for, uh, uh, for, for temporary workers, and the workers need to control that pathway. Otherwise, employers can keep them in a backlog or, or hold it, lord it over them. Uh, and then there are some new protections that we need to uh, put in place through uh, some pieces of legislation that have been proposed before, uh, like the Power Act uh, that's, uh, that protects uh, migrant workers from retaliation. We need more U visas that are, uh, apply to more labor violations uh, rather than just uh, the types of crimes that they apply to now. Um, and we need more laws uh, that prohibit uh, retaliation uh, uh, based on immigration status. And then I think finally, uh, we really need to appropriate more funding for labor standards enforcement. In 2018, there was, uh, what did we have? I think $24 billion were, uh, were appropriated for uh, um, immigration enforcement, where only $2 billion were there for all of the labor standards enforcement agencies. And so uh, that really shows what our priorities are. Our priorities are keeping immigrants out rather than uh, ensuring that people who are here have, uh, have labor rights. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, especially on the, the Department of Labor side, that I know we've been talking about immigration, but if you're thinking about labor standards and protecting workers' rights, uh, really boosting the capacity of the Department of Labor to actually enforce the laws that it's supposed to enforce, I think is is very much a part of this, um, you know, and, and I think that that's part of it. Um, and obviously, um, with civil society, obviously the way labor unions and, and employers need to work together in Germany, that's, you know, part, that is a foundation of their society. They have government employers and la organized labor meet and continuously always develop policies. So if there is a way for civil society groups and the government to sort of get together and try to at least find a way, a consensus around protecting the rights of temporary workers, that's very important. And I think that's a lesson that we can take from the German model, which I think has been very successful in balancing those interests. Chris, let me follow up with you on that. Um, and, and just looking at the European models, uh, Daniel mentioned the UK model of a, of a council. Um, other countries, how do other countries, one of the things that they do a lot better than we do, and Julia mentioned this, is just data collection, right? So they have some of the, a, a lot more yeah, data, yeah. They, and they collect more data, and they do have these expert panels that help them with things. Is, can you talk a little bit about that? I think the gold standard is Canada, uh, to be honest, that the Canadians gather so much data on immigration into the country. That it, I think it allows them to have, I think, a little bit better capacity to understand what the immigration system needs to do and the problem and how to meet the policy priorities, how to select individual immigrants. So when we say data, I mean they look at longitudinal studies of integration or where, like you know, or uh, longitudinal studies of like uh, employment-based integration, or they call it uh, economic class integration, um, where they're going, where they're working, how long they're working. Um, you know, doing research for this report, I it was fascinating is just sort of see just the level of data that they gather in order to really get a sense of how well basically how can they improve the management of their systems um the european systems vary I, you know some of them were were okay I, I wouldn't say that they're up to to uh 
um, to the level of Canada. And and I, I shouldn't say that the United States doesn't do that. We we do produce quite a bit of data, but I think the Canadians just have so much more data that allows them to make better, more targeted decisions. That I think any time that we're going to start talking about immigration reform and that we're going to talk about a new system, we need to expand our data gathering capacity so we have more data, much more relevant data, and data that allows policymakers and civil society groups to basically make better informed decisions about what we should be doing with immigration. I think any system that we transition to that doesn't have that is just going to be repeating a lot of the same mistakes that we have now. So we, we, we are at the end of our time. Well, I was going to let everybody have a, a final remark, and Julia hasn't had a chance in a little while. So I'm going to turn to Julia. Is there, do you have any final thoughts on this on this topic before we sign off today? Julia. Yeah, just really quickly, I think, you know, we need to think about kind of how immigration benefits us and think about what are our goals for our immigration system? What what do we think that, you know, the United States benefits from in having an immigration system, an employment-based immigration system, and really look at what are our economic trends, what are our economic needs, how are immigrants benefiting us, and how are they not, and just really design our system around that. And I think we also need to acknowledge that we do some things really well through our employer-selected system. We do a good job of maximizing on the talents of immigrants that we bring in. We may have a lot of problems in our system, but there are things that we do well and that we shouldn't overcorrect um, and in bringing in, you know, large numbers of family-based immigrants, we are bringing in a lot of workers who probably are quite successful in our labor market. So, you know, having more data, of course, will help to understand what's going well and what's not. But I think we shouldn't fix what's not broken, and we should just think about how immigration can benefit us as our primary frame. Thank you. Daniel, some final remarks from you? Uh, yes, I just, uh, for my final remark, I'll just piggyback on what uh, Chris was saying about the data in the United States. You know, we do have a lot of data, but our labor migration data is just absolutely uh, very, very poor. Uh, a lot, we, we have a lot of data that gets collected, but a lot of it is still collected on paper files that are sitting in warehouses, and that's just not consistent with the, you know, standards of a developed country. And so we know very, very little about what's happening, especially in the temporary uh, labor migration programs, and uh, you know there there has been some legislation proposed called the it's called the Visa Transparency Anti Trafficking Act that would require regular reporting and electronic collecting and a database that would have information uh, on temporary labor migration programs in the U S. I think something like that has to you know has to pass of, otherwise the the federal agencies aren't going to do it on their own and without knowing more about uh, you know what's happening in our temporary systems. It's uh, it's even harder to make smart uh, policies and decisions about uh, about how how to structure our permanent system. Well, uh, with that, I'm going to close off because we're a couple minutes after our allotted time. But I want to thank our panelists, thank Julia Jalot from Migration Policy Institute and Daniel Costa from Employment Policy Institute, Chris Ramon, the author from BPC, the author of this report. I want to thank hold, you for joining on. us. Hold on, you, you you said Employment Policy Institute, which is a uh, an, a, a different institute that, that <laughs> advocates for the exact opposite of what we uh, of what we uh, push for. So it's the Economic Policy Institute. Economic Policy <laughs> Institute. I my apologies. The evil EPI. <laughs> I'm sorry, your e your evil twin organization. So uh, the 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 Economic Policy Institute. Thank you, Daniel, for for correcting me. Um, you can see, uh, we'll show you in a second a slide uh, where you can get uh, folks Twitter handles if you want to follow everybody. Obviously, you can find more from us at the Bipartisan Policy uh, website at bipartisanpolicy.org. I also encourage you to look up the Economic Policy Institute, which is epi.org. Am I right, Daniel? Yes. Yes. And the Migration Policy Institute, which is migrationpolicy.org. Am I right, Julia? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panels. Um, a video of this will be posted up to our website at some point. Uh, we're still learning the new, the new uh, technologies, but uh, for those who missed it, feel free to pass along. And thank you very much for joining us and have a good day.